Well, well, Mayor, thank you. Uh, Mayor reached out about looking in the barber shops and the salons. We've been, we just so you know, we have been working with my task force on on figuring out what type of safety would be necessary. So they have been talking with folks, working on uh, talking with some medical, working on guidance. But obviously, we wanted to solicit feedback from people who do this about what would you be thinking? How do you do it in a way uh, that that reduces uh, that makes the risk small? Because at the end of the day, you know, if you're doing things that are safe and the risk is small, you have a right to apply your craft. And so we want to get to yes. We want to be judicious and methodical and be safe about it. Uh, but I think that, that, that we have an opportunity to do it. Can we just go around, um, introduce, and maybe just say a few things? I'll, I'll kick it off, pass it over to the mayor, and then we just engage in a discussion about, about what we're going to do. Go ahead. Um, Bro, Freedom Health Officer for the county. You guys have done a great job. I want to thank you for all your hard work. You really, if you look at Orange County, no, both of you, you look at Orange County, so how they weathered this. Uh, I don't think anyone would have predicted um, what has happened. I mean, it's just been really good. But you guys uh, at the health department have done great, so thank you. Yeah, we weren't expecting it, but um, yeah, it has gone very well. So uh, has been gratifying to see that your plan is measured, uh, has different steps. And you also have the ability to consume the data and see how it's reported. Uh, it is, you know, we had some concerns at the beginning before everyone developed any plan, right? Because part of this pandemic is what we're trying to explain to people. It's not this worse or better or anything. It's the speed of which it becomes used. And we have to avoid overwhelming the healthcare system, which has not happened, fortunately for us. So we are extremely happy to see a plan that has different steps. We have engaged in conversations with many of the members of the task force and uh, the, the industry. They will tell you that they are willing to take a extraordinary steps to reduce that transmission that you're talking about. Great. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Mike Taylor, Bill Mosaic here studio. I'm one of the task force members. I do appreciate you taking the time, working the family, the new one, to come out here and listen to our, listen to the discussion from the industry. A um, couple of points I'd like to make. We are all trained, we are licensed to train. State of Florida certi certifies us through training. Um, I think if you just look around this, uh, this salon, and this is, these are all protocol steps that are normal on a regular daily basis for sty licensed stylists. Um, so I know that during, during the uh, grand opening, we'll all be taking measured steps, calculated steps to reopen. In fact, I've, shared, I've created a video for our staff if you'd like to see it, I'd be more than happy to share it with you. Uh, it's really about hand washing. We've, we've uh, purchased a, a sink on front of our salon. We're asking all, all clients before they enter to come in. We're doing social distancing scheduling, which I believe all, all salons are currently doing now. So that means no double booking. So one client at a time, no one in between while someone's color is processing. Uh, we've removed any items that can be touched. Uh, we're asking no one to touch the products. We've removed any the candy jars. Uh, we've up, upgraded our the sanitation practices, our tools implementation, the cleaning of the stations. I really feel that between the guidance that we've received from Dr. Rawls and in between the mask hand washing, really focused on being brilliant at the basics, I think our industry is definitely ready to open up. Great. Thank you. Hi, first, welcome to our salon. Sure. Uh, my husband and I own It's very salon. clean. I mean, like, it's, it's much cleaner than being in, like, most people's homes, so you do a good job. So, welcome to our salon. Um, we've been here for two years, um, and we take a lot of pride in our salon and our staff and our clients. Um, we've taken every measure, even before um, this happened, to ensure that everyone's safe. But after the fact, just to piggyback off of what you said, um, we have hand sanitizer by the dozen. Then here we have a manufacturer here in Orlando that supplies it to us, so it's always readily available. Um, we've even gone a step further to order disposable cake, so it's never touching again. Um, we have a mask in the front just in case someone doesn't bring one in. We've supplied masks to all of our stylists. Um, our biggest thing is we don't want to just keep ourselves safe. Um, I don't want to just keep the staff safe and their families. We love our clients. Those are like an extended portion of our family. So we want to keep them safe. Like you said, we follow sanitization guidelines in order to get your license. So in order to keep it, you want to be able to not get a lawsuit and all this other stuff. You want to make sure that you do exactly what you're supposed to do. So we have our stylists in here coming in on a scattered schedule. 
So not just a full salon, because all of our stations are taken up. We have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, um, Thursday, Saturday, one client at a time. And once that client is done, they have to sanitize. We have sanitization of shampoo bowls. Um, we've even gone a step further and got contactless soap for their hands, the dryers, even though that's not what we normally do. We want to make sure everyone is safe. We're professional enough to protect ourselves and our clients. We just want the opportunity. Um, we're not getting the help that we need because it's so exacerbated already. Um, we just want the opportunity to help ourselves. And we've been doing this our whole entire career. We just want to be able to continue to do it. Great. Thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. Hi. Hi, my name is Mary Jo. Um, I'm the CEO of the MC Spa, and uh, I've been in uh, the um, Orange County for over 27 years, opened the business here. Uh, what happened right now is uh, bring it up to a very important for all the licensed who are professional um, in the, what we already been doing professional and get the license, but in the other side, um, I already tried to <clears throat> put all together with the guideline for even the customer, from the employer, we have a two guideline for you know the what the product that we get, uh, what is the the um, you know the tool to clean up all the store, and I have everything I put in the guideline. Uh, I will uh, give to you later. It's a little bit about so you have a, a idea of what is the nail salon uh, uh, make the customer or make the uh, employee or even their community safe. So I put everything in here, and I will get a chance to show you a little bit later what do we going to do. When the, the customer walk into the door, what are you going to do? How do you guide them? How do you talk to them? Walk into, how do you serve them? Before service, during service, after the service, and with the, everybody have their different uh, thing to do. Their uh, owner, the manager, the um, you know, receptionist, their, uh, the worker, uh, technician, for all, everybody have to be a team and well trained before we open. So as, as soon as if, uh, you like all the open, so we have at least for a couple of days, retrain and you know uh, make sure that everybody know exactly what they do and follow what the chapter or the CBD or the doctor or you know from the state. So great. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to reviewing that. Yes. Yes, sir. Thanks Welcome. for having me. Yeah. My name is Jay Henry. I own a barber shop here in downtown Orlando native of Orlando. Thank you, Mayor, for giving me the opportunity to be on the Economic Task Force along with my other friends. The doctors are here. And I think that we all are somewhat speaking the same language and have the same kind of concerns. I would first like to start off with the fact that I've been in the business for over 36 long years. We all in this profession have been trained from day one that we got to be clean and make sure we take care of ourselves, our family, our co-workers, and our clients. One thing that I really, really enjoy about being in this profession, it has to be a gift that was birthed into you before you get into this profession to bring you into the profession, first of all. And once you learn to be clean, safe, and continue to keep your environment safe, that's very, very important. Having said that, most barbers and stylists and nail techs, this is second nature to us, along with all the other type of uh, advice that we're getting from the professionals, it helped enhance the things that we've already done. You know as well that inspectors come in the barbershop and hair salons all the time. We used to this kind of stuff. So having said that, we want to continue to govern ourselves accordingly, do the right thing, get back to work, but get back to work safe. Having said that as well, we want to make sure that, and I can speak for all barbershops and hair salons, getting the professional support or the, the finances, if you will, that we need. That'll be another conversation later, but we need that so we won't compromise the principles and guidelines that are put in place. Because right now, we're all dealing with this financial setback, if you will, in this profession. So having said that, once you all, as, gov as the governor, help empower the business owners in this profession with the support that they need from the government, financial support with the loans and grants and all these different types of things, it'll kind of help us keep things balanced because once we get back to work, we're going to need the money to stay in business because we're in the red.
forcing people to come in the barbershop so they have a large over capacity. So I'm sure you kind of somewhat get my point. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Well, Governor, let me just uh, welcome you here to Orange County to the greater Orlando area. Um, you heard uh, from uh, many of our business owners here. I've known Nadine for quite a number of years, and uh, John Henry, we went to high school together, although I was a couple of years ahead of uh, John Henry, but I know Wait, them so to be Jones High School here in Orlando. Jones High School, the Tigers. <laughs> and uh, let me just say that uh, after uh, listening to some of the impassioned pleas from um, the uh, ownership group here, part of our economic recovery task force, uh, they convinced me that they were able to uh, open with the right sanitary measures in place, and uh, you've heard them talk about that repeatedly here today. So I do believe that as we balance the reopening with the need for safety in our community, this is one of those areas that uh, I believe they can do it. Uh, I have no concern about whether they can do it safely or not. And so I know that's important to you is that uh, as we reopen Florida, uh, the businesses have to have a number of uh, safety measures in place. And so uh, they have shared with me a number of things that would allow them to do it. So thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, hearing us uh, out here within the region. We have tried to uh, take a regional approach as we reopen. So uh, I'm uh, one of the few elected countywide mayors in Florida but I have reached out to the county chairs in the surrounding counties, and uh, we are pretty much in agreement about uh, how we move forward with the reopening. And uh, the Economic Recovery Task Force that we have in place is, is have a regional uh, outlook, and uh, they consistently have said that they believe that this is uh, the right balance here as we move forward. I'm guided by uh, the positions that you see here uh, Dr. Pino is the state health officer here at uh, Orange County, a phenomenal individual. Uh, he has just been wonderful to work with as we have dealt with the pandemic. And Dr. Rawls, I've worked with, uh, yeah, he is a senior official with Orlando Health, and you're very familiar with them. He's formerly uh, the director of public safety for the county itself, and he understands the county government uh, as well. And so with that, uh, they are uh, my principal advisors, and everything that they said to me is that they felt like there's a way for this to be able to move forward and, and to do so safely. So, again, thank you Great. for being here. So, so you, um, as we look at this, I mean, you know, when we approached our um, our task force for for the next steps for Florida, uh, my instructions was that to them is as we look at the economy. This idea of essential versus non-essential is what, what had been done by, I don't know if that's public health over the years. So that was kind of the framework we were looking in. And as we were going down that road, it became clear to me that that was simply inadequate. Because if this is your business, it sure as heck is essential to you. And if you have a job in one of these industries that some government official says is non-essential, I'm pretty sure you think that's essential too. So what we said is, I'm not going to sit there and say, this is important and that's not. What we want to do is, if you have something like, like these personal services, what's the risk level? And is there a way we can lower the risk level? And if you lower, if you make things that are low risk, people have a, have a, have a right to buy their trade and make a living. And that's the approach we've taken. Now, they have gotten into this on my task force, had, had, had started to do. We weren't quite ready when we did the original announcement, but this is something that we're uh, interested in. So can you just talk about from a medical perspective, um, you know, are there things that they can do to make this someone coming in and getting a, their hair done to be a low risk? Sure. Thanks, Governor. Uh, absolutely. I think this is a good example of a, uh, a well-regulated uh, industry. These are uh, professionals that are used to really high sanitary practice expectations. Um, I think there's great physical space opportunities here. As you can see, um, a place like this, you have six feet between each chair pretty much automatically. Um, and you also have a lot of awareness about um, client movement. They know how to schedule. They know what type of adjustments to make there. There are going to be some things that I think are certainly going to be different, like masking. And this could be, we, we talked about mandatory masking versus um, you know expecting people to do that. This might be an environment where you say our clients need to be masked, and they might know that. He didn't know that when they scheduled to come in for a, for a session, you'll need to wear a mask. 
this is also maybe an environment we have some some additional uh, cleaning and sanitation expectations. We're hearing from Nadine that that was already part of the plan. So, um, so again, I think um, a, a group of business owners that we um, should expect is going to do the right thing. So, I think for the most part, that's happening every day already. I just want to add one other thing, Governor. Is I, I think as, as you and the mayor are making these difficult policy decisions, I think it's important to point out to the patrons of these businesses they have an expectation to. As community members, we have to be responsible. We should not come to a uh, to a salon if we're sick. Stay home. If you're asked to wash your hands, wash your hands. If you're asked to wear a mask, understand why they're doing that. They're asking you to help protect them so that they can protect this economy and this community. So I absolutely think we can do this safely, and I agree absolutely with the mayor on that. Great. Now, you probably have some clients that are chomping at the bit to get in here, right, I'd imagine? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the pressure's high. Uh, um, how, uh, so I, I think you guys have uh, talked about some stuff. So do you all agree that, that having the stylist wear, wear facial covering would be fine totally. and that that would be smart? And then you'd also provide that for the, the client that comes in? I mean, many of them probably already have masks, but if they don't, you, you think providing that option uh, would, would, would make sense? Totally, that, that's a very common sense uh, approach. Um, like I've seen several businesses that are still open where they require you to wear a mask going in. It just would be no different walking in wearing a mask. So I feel that's very reasonable and doable. And I know plenty of clients have been sewing masks that are available on head. Their masks are definitely, cloth masks are definitely available to the general public. Uh, they don't have to be the big full and whatever the high tech ones are. Uh, so clients are actually are wanting to wear masks coming in. Uh, prior to uh, the shutdown, uh, we had already taken lots of precautions and lots of steps as we were kind of gearing up. And clients thanked us. I'm sure you all had clients that thanked you for already stepping up the sanitation levels. Um, in this industry, there's one thing that will really ruin you quickly, and that's online reviews. We all know the power of yep. Nobody in this industry wants a terrible Google or Yelp review about inferior sanitation right now. I can guarantee you everyone is doing everything and then some to make sure that when the clients do return, that we'll all be really ready to go. Do we, because um, obviously salons are open uh, January, February, most of March, um, and maybe uh, Dr. Pino, but is there is there any evidence that there was actually an outbreak that ever emanated from a salon in Central Florida that we know? Yeah. I would like to add yep. that for us, um, wearing a mask is not optional. Okay. Um, that is our normal, our new normal. Yep. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that the old normal, we have to put that aside, and we have to be able to guide our clients to be able to say, this is what's a requirement in this establishment. It's not a choice because we have other people to protect, not just you. Um, and so the fact of the matter is, is because these are our babies. Um, it's important to have these things in place anyway. Um, and we have to make sure they do because you don't want it to happen again. Our families depend on us. And when you said this is essential, it is essential. Um, and we have essential workers going to work not looking so essential. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, not, they're not looking their best, and that's what we provide. And truthfully, Hair salons and barbershops, those are the main arteries of a lot of our communities. And once you cut that, we could bleed out financially, and that's not okay for us. And we don't want to go to someone's home and say, okay, I'll just do you off the grid. I don't want to do that because that's not the proper example. But what do we do when we're faced between that and feeding our children? No, 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 I, I get it. And not only that, but I mean, I don't know if you notice, like, there'll be people that are, like, talking heads on TV that'll say, you can't open everything up. And yet... They've been doing this for six weeks, and their hair always looks good. How does that magically happen? <laughs> so you can't you can't open your shop, but they somehow always have good hair. I mean, I haven't had a haircut in two months. Not that that's the important thing, but I mean, I'm coming on like a mullet almost with how much my hair's grown. But like, you know, people but somehow people do that. So yeah, no, it's um, it's it's crazy. So um, so in terms of like. Obviously, when you come here, uh, people, it's, it's, it's a time to kind of socialize. People see they, it's, it's a fun time, barbershops. So how are you going to be able to manage that? Are you going to just limit the entry? Because I imagine normally you'd have some people just kind of hanging out and having fun. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're trying to reduce density, are you going to do, like at the barbershop, just appointments? Are you going to have people wait outside if they're waiting? How have you thought about that? Well, see, the plan is, I, uh, I thought about just like the driver's license office. I have a sign-in list. I have a person sign in with your cell phone. 
once they come to the barbershop, they're sitting out in their car, you can text them or call them and say, hey, it's your time. They can come on in the barbershop, get their hair cut, and keep it moving. Because one thing we want to keep in mind, saving lives is more important to me and all of us than making money. Right. Of course, we need to make money, but we got to be able to live and be helped in order to make the money sure. to continue to take care of ourselves and our families and one another. Having said that, all of us collectively know as hairstylists, most of the people, the clientele that come into the barbershops and hair salons, they basically already know the standards of that particular salon, of that particular barbershop. That's one of the major reasons why they go to that barbershop. Like in my barbershop, and I'm getting a plug right now, I don't allow profanity in my barbershop. Please cover your underwear when you walk through the door. These different types of things that we in this profession have always had in place long before the coronavirus came into effect, that's what kept us in business, those little small things that meant so much to other people. So we thrive on continuing to do the things that we've always done along with the new changes that are taking place. So it's normal and natural for us as stylists and barbers. Right. Can we have everyone speak up? Um, we're having a hard time with the drums in the background here. Everyone. To address your concern, uh, Governor, about kind of congregating an entourage, which every salon, regardless of community, has, we've all asked our clients, please, one person at a time, leave your entourage at home. We're doing exactly like Jay Henry's Barbershop. Now, we work mainly off of appointments, so it might be a recommendation that salons that tend to be more on the walk-in side maybe use an appointment system so, so people don't congregate at the front. And we've asked clients, when you do arrive for your appointment, please stay in your car, call us, and when we're ready for you, we will call you and then you can come on in. So, I, so we're really client or crowd management is what we're doing through our scheduling book. The way she's doing it by having different shifts and whatnot limits the number of people that come in at any one time. And by scheduling and using appointment systems, we can definitely do that. One of the things we've noticed, um, I think the data has been overwhelming really from the beginning of this is different age groups are at different risk from this. So if you look in Florida, I think we're uh, between 80 and 85 percent of the deaths have been 65 and up. And even as you get into 75 and up, the, the rate goes higher. So is there a need to do anything special for, for seniors or do you think the same same procedures would just work across the board. And I'm not saying you would need to do anything anything special, because I think what you're doing seems like it would be safe, but it's just something we probably need to think about. I definitely think that that is something that's imperative. So um, even though we're normally closed Sunday and Mondays, those would be the days to be able to say, listen, these are the days we're gonna cater to only you. Yeah. Um, because they're important. Those are our grandmothers, our parents, yes. our great-grandmothers, those are people that I love. Um, and so it's important to take care of them. I was raised to take care of my elderly, and so that's just what it is. It's going to be a sacrifice for everyone. So it's like you said, it's not just about the money. We care about our clients and anyone that's underneath our roof. And so the standard is Sunday and Monday, that's your day. Come in here and, and get taken care of because you want to be beautiful too. You want to get your hair cut too. Our clients are, my phone is ringing off the hook. And it's my elderly client. Yeah. When can I come in for my run and say? <laughs> um, and so you want to be able to do it. You just have to be able, just like any other store is taking care of them. You don't want them to be ran over. You want them to be taken care of. So, um, Nadine, let me ask you this. Uh, at what age would you start the seniors at? Is that like 16? <laughs> <laughs> that day seems like it would be anyone that is, first of all, pre-existing conditions would be those people that we would as assume along with the people that are elderly. Sure. Um, so, if someone is younger and they may have gray hair like myself, you know, they can come in as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. But I'm, I'm assuming that anything that collects um, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I think that's smart what you're thinking about doing because, I mean, just the, the bottom line is you have somebody, you know, I'm 41 like me. If, if I were to get it in a, in, in a, in a barber shop, it's not, I have the chance, the risk for me is low. But then it would be, I may not even know I have it. And then if I pass it along to someone in one of the at risk groups, and obviously we're taking the social distance, but just generally speaking, if you have somebody um, in that, um, 
when you have somebody who's in the at-risk group, then obviously if they were to, to get it themselves, uh, we're not as, you know, it's not like they're gonna transmit it as the big fear, it's what will happen to them. So, so I think that's a great idea, and um, you know, that may be some type of best practice uh, that, that we could think about going. You were gonna yeah, say- Yeah, that's exactly, you know, the, a lot of these issues that, that you're bringing up can be addressed literally by proper scheduling. Yep. And I know a lot of salons, we actually, we are obsessive about our book our scheduling because nobody wants to feel the pressure of having a press. So the salons are used to client management and scheduling. And in this case, we're dealing with the at risk. We know who our clients are. We know who the elderly are, who are at risk clients. But we've had a we've had a relationship with them. We know their life history. We know their drama. The reason they're six feet is not for social distancing. It's a, so the other person is to hear the the drama that's going on, right? <laughs> so we've salons have already policies in place to account for anyone who is at, at high risk. And of course, we love our clients, and we would do anything with, like opening up on days off to accommodate them. That's great. So what, is there anything else we're missing, or what, what else do you think uh, we need? Because I think what we'd like to do is, obviously this has been helpful, we'll take your recommendations. I've had folks working on this as well. We'll uh, talk with the mayor about any other folks that he's had that's been helpful, and um, uh, try to get a set of uh, a set of best practices, and, and maybe we'll run it through the cosmetology board or the barber board, and um, and if it and if it vets and it's safe, then then I think we have a responsibility to, to get the yes on this stuff. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we need to go ahead safe. I mean, our mantra is safe, smart, step by step. Be very methodical, data driven, but having healthy small businesses is important to be able to, to fight any health problems because if the society is not functioning our ability to, to deal with this is not going to be as, as strong um, you also have all kind of other health i mean this virus is not the only health issue that we deal with as our society i mean we have mental health we have other we have fear that's been, that's permeated our society such that people have significant heart pains stroke symptoms, they're not even going into the hospitals uh, now because they're scared they're gonna get the virus and die when the heart is much more of a risk for them. So I think it's it's obviously we want you guys to be able to be solvent and be, be successful again, but then I just think also just having things like this, I think confidence people see, oh yeah, you know, you'll be able to go in and get your hair cut again. It, it just, it, it's, it's a step towards um, a more healthy society. So I think it's, I think it's important that, that, that we that we deal with this. Um, I think we're going to deal with it in a way that's safe, of course. But but I think we've got to. We, we are very creative people in Florida. Don't tell me we can't figure out a way to do things safely. And I know you all are committed to that. Yes, sir. I just want to continue to add this because I've got a lot of questions about this. That sound like a broken record coming from me, but I got to talk about it because it's on my mind. And a lot of people mind that I know. Small, small business owners that have applied for the PPP loans and grants and stuff, none of us have heard anything, okay? anything. And I think it's very, very important that we don't overlook this. Going back to work is great because that's what we've always done yeah. all of our careers. But trying to hold things together, how, when, where, who, who to talk to about getting connected to the small, small business owners that do not know how much longer that their business will hold on, even if we start working today. Right. If you lift the band today, hey guys, you guys can go back to work today. Yeah, but I know the silent echo of what am I gonna do with all this, these bills that are piled up since I've been out of work. So I wanna continue to press on that because I know it's for a good cause and a great purpose for all of us that we need to get connected to these loans and these funds that are available that the people in this profession, and not only in my profession, all over the country and in this state as well, that you are, you, you're the governor of. You gotta get connected to these loans and these grants so you can kind of empower these businesses to stay alive. Having said that, us business owners, if we know that we've gotten connected to some funds that are on the way, it's easy to stay connected to one client at a time, one appointment at a time, because I got something to hold me together until this curve flattens a lot more. We can keep clients out of the barbershop or out of the hair salons 
trying so to make you the apply money for PPP? Yes, I did. Okay, so so PPP, I think I think you guys, but it's a federal program. So I've been working. So Senator Rubio was really instrumental of it. I've been working with him uh, on it. Um, I think the, the the goal of it was you're basically stopping the economy, at least portions of the economy. And so, what are you going to do? And so, the idea was is to provide for small business, which you saw a lot of the bigger companies were getting the money. That's what we talked. So about. they ran out of money. Some of the big companies were giving it back. They they replenished it. There's still been some some issues with it. But what I think I may do is maybe have him uh, do do something for Floridians, like try to put out some more information. Maybe we'll do an event to do it because you know, what we did at the state level was we knew PPP was coming. Uh, this, the Congress was talking about it, but uh, we did a $50 million bridge loan program. Now, I, under the law, I can't just forgive that, but it's an extremely low, low interest loan, very flexible. And that, people took that. I mean, we ran out of money on that, and so we're going to see after PPP is exhausted. We need to do something at the state level. I mean, I, I want to do it. Uh, so, so we'll, but I, I, you need the PPP. That was, you're the exact person that this was, that this was supposed to be for. And, um, so, so we're gonna we're gonna work with the federal government. I mean, I fortunately am able. You know, I know all the the folks in the administration, Secretary Mnuchin, and all these folks. If they want to get it right, this this was not an easy thing to put together just overnight. Because you go back February, no one thought that we were going to be doing this when you got to the towards the end of March. Uh, so, so it got done, and so so we are where we are in it. But yeah, I think the the small businesses are really the ones that need it. I mean, the good thing is is. You don't even need as much money. I mean, the big companies, they're taking out tens of millions of dollars. You know, just a small amount of money will go huge. It'll help a business stay solvent, help the employees and all that stuff. So I think it's really important. So we're gonna, I'm gonna work with, I've, I've, talked, with, I've talked with Rubio a lot, um, and this is his passion is, so we're gonna, we need to make sure everyone's got the information. And there's, there's definitely some administrative issues with it because it's such a amount of, big amount of money, but uh, I think we've got to get there. And then once we figure out, okay, who definitely qualifies or doesn't, or the money run out, then at the state level, we can then look at some of ours, and we don't have the ability to charge us on the credit card like the federal government, so we'd have to prioritize. Uh, but I do think it's important as we get the economic base back the small businesses are the engine. I mean, you know, we've had the big companies have been running the whole time, most of them. I mean, a lot of the healthcare companies, obviously, health insurance, utilities, all this stuff, they're all considered essential defense. The space stuff on the Space Coast, all of it. And, and that's important, and there's a lot of good jobs there. But if you look, most of the jobs are connected to smaller businesses. And so we've absolutely got to keep them, keep them going. Thank you. And, and Governor, I wanted to share something that we're doing here within Orange County. As we have listened to some of the small businesses that have been given the green light to reopen and live, uh, you make the decision that uh, the hair salons, et cetera, will reopen. We wanted to make certain that we have the ability to provide them with all of the different sanitary pieces that they need to be able to reopen. So we are the recipients here within Orange County of about $243 million in CARES Act funds to do a number of things. Great. One of the things that we have done is Orange County has purchased about one million masks and then about 200,000 pieces of hand sanitizer that we will uh, hope to receive shipment this week coming up. And we will, for those businesses who have not been able to access the supply chain with those types of pieces of, of uh, protective equipment, we're going to provide that to them so that they can uh, open in a safe manner. So I just wanted you to understand that we're trying to look at this holistically to get our small businesses back up and running to the extent we can. And uh, I stay on the good side of Dr. Pino and the Department of Health as well. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's great that you guys um, you know are getting those funds. I know we have um, you know a handful of counties in the Florida that uh, that qualified uh, the way they did the criteria. Only one city in Florida qualifies, Jacksonville, because you had to be over a certain amount. So you have Dade County, Broward, Orange, some of some of the some of our bigger counties, which I think will be helpful. And then we uh, we have some CARES Act money too, which can can be used, and we're looking at ways you can use it for some of the economic assistance to, to the businesses. So we may be able to, there may be some room to do some of that stuff. Because we have not seen hospitals overrun or any of that, we're just in point of fact not gonna have to use that money for as much help as I think people initially thought. We set up 
I mean, we had field hospitals ready and, and all kinds of places. Uh, the Miami Beach Convention Center, the Army Corps called me, he's like, hey, do you need anything? I'm like, I don't think so, but you know, what do you do? He's like, well, I'll build you a field hospital. I'm like, all right, let's go to Miami. So they built it there. No, no one's used it. I mean, it's like in Miami, I think, had 45% of its ICU beds were, were not being used. So in terms of that flattened curve, don't let the hospitals overwhelm, um, you know, I think we're in a pretty good spot there. So some of this stuff really can be used. Okay, the virus has dislocated a lot of parts of the economy. You know, let's figure out if there's ways that we can that we can get it back. But, but I think at the end of the day, uh, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when with, with the salons. We just want to be very judicious. We always want to consult with medical folks um, and want to make sure that, that safety's first. But as I was thinking about it, no one's going to care more about safety than the people that own these places. I mean, it's just you have to do it. It's very important for you. It's in your interest to do it. And um, and, and I'm confident that, um, uh, that that a lot of you guys are going to going to do the right thing. So so we're going to get there. We're going to take. We'll take your recommendations. We'll take what we did uh, today. And uh, I'm gonna. I'll have some of my task force folks work on it. Um, but but but, we, but we've got to get there. So so you have my commitment to work to get there.